Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In this third video in a new series that's looking at the most recent archaeological updates on the truly ancient pre-pottery Neolithic sites of southeastern Anatolia, we'll be taking a look at Harbetsavan Tepesi. This is one of the 12 Tashtepela sites, but it's far smaller than Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. But according to archaeologists, it could be the key to really understanding the Neolithic in this region. Harbetsavan Tepesi is located around 55 kilometers southeast of the modern city of Shanlurfa, perched on top of a limestone hill, and the enormous site of Karahan Tepe is only 7 kilometers away. In fact, there is a direct line of sight from Harbetsavan Tepesi to Karahan Tepe, and on a clear day, you can even see Gebekli Tepe, which is located 35 kilometers away. This site was only discovered in 2014, and the first excavations took place between 2017 and 2019, where enclosures, pillars, and other pre-pottery Neolithic finds were discovered. It was described as a cultic center, a satellite of Karahan Tepe, and was dated to the pre-pottery Neolithic B, between 11,000 and 10,500 years ago. But this year, in the summer of 2022, excavations recommenced, and amazingly, the archaeologists found evidence of an earlier phase of occupation, believed to be sometime between the late Epi Paleolithic to the early pre pottery Neolithic A. That's between 13,000 and 11,500 years ago. This means the origins of Harbetsavan Tepesi could actually be older than both Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, and that's based on the current level of knowledge, which of course is changing all the time. At the minute, the early phase is only characterized by surface finds, finds such as lithic tools, and the archaeology has not yet been excavated and examined meaning that Harbetsavan Tepesi is a very exciting prospect, and we may be on the verge of learning about the people in this region just before Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe were constructed. This makes it a key site in the wider landscape. This year, the site has also been subject to geophysical surveys, and not only have numerous rectangular buried structures been found, there is also what looks like a circular boundary wall around the site. This implies the site may not actually have been a cultic center, but it could actually be a domestic settlement for hunter-gatherers. There really is so much more work to do, to understand the later phase of occupation in the pre-pottery Neolithic B, when it was occupied at the same time as when Karahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe were large thriving settlements, but we also need to understand the earlier phase. The early phase may give us a glimpse into the lives of the people in this region before they built the large nearby settlements. We may be able to see their early construction styles, their art, their diets, and so on. We can compare the finds to neighboring sites and maybe get a better understanding of the development of the pre pottery Neolithic era. We already know there are archaeological layers from the Epi Paleolithic to early pre pottery Neolithic A at Bonkuklu Tala, Kortik Tepe, and Gusir Hoyuk. And with the same now being seen at Harbetsavan Tepesi, I do wonder if one day we'll also find the same at Gebekli Tepe in Karahan Tepe. Remember, only a small percentage of these mega sites have been excavated so far. And so, it will be interesting to see how the story develops in the future. In the same way I showcased Dr. Lee Clare in my recent Gebekli Tepe video, in this video I'll be showcasing archaeologist Kazuya Shimigama from the Chiba Institute of Technology, who has been working at Harbetsavan Tepesi this year and is a leading authority on the site. He took part in the recent Tashtapela presentation that was streamed on the Archaeology Harbour YouTube channel that I've linked below. And once again, I do have permission to include his part in full, so you can hear the full archaeological update on what is proving to be another fascinating site in the southeast Anatolia region of Turkey. 
please do subscribe to the Archaeology Harbour YouTube channel because they're doing great work to bring the latest information to a mass audience. Thank you for watching, please subscribe and enjoy. So, thanks to the large-scale excavations and multiple studies at Yobeku Tepe and recently at Kahan Tepe and other sites, we have a wide range of sensational material culture of the early Holocene. Nevertheless, we know very little about the early Neolithic of the Shanru Ufa region, especially why and how it, remar it, it emerged. We are now in the first stage of research, I suppose. We are still trying to collect data sets concerning early sedent sedentism high resolution chronology, domestication and domesticization process, settlement and demographic dynamics, to name but a few. I'm talking about the small Neolithic site, Harvet Swan Tepesi. As I explain later, as, uh, although the site is very small in size, it may offer us a key understand a key to understand the Neolithic in the region. After three years of excavations by Turkish archaeologists, a renewed investigation started with our new archaeological project. Here I would like to present the first results of the field work. First, we, be we begin with geographic settings of the site. Harvet Swan Tepesi is located about 55 kilometers southeast of the modern city of San Ufa in Ayubia district, as you can see here. The site lies on top of the limestone hills of Lower Miocene, which form part of the westernmost ranges of the Tek Tek mountain and overlooking the Haram plain to the west. As you can see from this satellite image, the rugged landscape and its geographic setting may prevent us from grasping the location of the site. Here I will show you how the site and its surrounding landscape look like. This is a view of the western escarpment of the site. Now, soil deposit eroded mainly from the limestone hills can be found only at the lower valley or lower terraces. On the contrary, the archaeological site is located on top of the hills. Here in the middle of the picture, we can see how the low mound accumulated with many stones with various sizes. In the landscape, there are no remarkable artificial deposits on the hill, other than some Neolithic mounds and Roman Byzantine tomb lie. Except for these, actually, we have found many locales having shallow archaeological deposits on the heads of valley. For these, I will talk on another occasion. From the site, one can command a good view of the large Neolithic settlement of Karhantepe, about seven kilometers to the northeast, as you see here. On days, on days with clear sky, we can also see Kebekui Tepe to the northwest in the distance of 35 kilometers as the crow flies. This intervisibility linking important centers suggests that Harvard Swan Tepesi may have had an important role in the Neolithic landscape and ideological life. Next, I have to mention the previous excavations by Turkish archaeologists. The site was first discovered during the Chandra Ufa Museum survey in 2014. A series of excavations were carried out uh, under the directorship of Professor Bahatin Celik. Uh, excuse me. from 2017 and 2019 because the site was subjected to illegal diggings. They opened about 11 excavation areas around these, around these looted pits in a way of rescue excavations to assess the site's stratigraphy. They revealed pea pottery Neolithic structures in various sounding trenches. The structures found were mostly subterranean rectangular buildings. Some of them had a pair of stone pillars inside. As a result, uh, excuse me, one of the most interesting finds was a seated male sculpture on your left, 
which reminds of stone sculpted figures from Kyobekui Tepe and Karahan Tepe. Other class of recovered artifacts include flint and obsidian tools, ground stone, incised stone objects, and stone beads. They show very close parallels, notably with the later levels of Kyobekui Tepe, leading the excavators to its dating to the early PPNB. As a result, Professor Bahatin Celik and others uh, revealed that Hobbit Fan was an important early Neolithic and small sized cultic center related to Quebecui Tepe, most probably a satellite site of Karahan Tepe. And they gave the date of the early PPNB exclusively on the basis of archaeological materials. But there are no radiocarbon or radiometric dates reported so far hindering from comparison with other important sites. Although some studies on the excavated materials are now ongoing by younger generations, detailed analysis of the chipped stone assemblage, faunal and flora remains have not been done, and many more remain to be understood for this site. In the summer of 2022 this year, renewed excavations have begun by the Japanese team of Chiba Institute of Technology and the University of Tokyo in collaboration with the Shanlu Ufa Museum. The new project aims to fully understand the Neolithic occupation history and dynamics of Hafez Van Tepesi in combination with detailed archaeological analyses and geographic geophysical researches. For our first season, we have four main goals. One, documentation of the site and previous excavation areas. Two, surface collection of artifacts. Three, cleaning and reassessing the excavated structures and obtaining the archaeological data. This goal includes collecting charcoal samples, chipped stone and animal bones. And lastly, geophysical surveys consisting of GPR and geomagnetic prospections. Firstly, documentation of the site and previous excavation areas was done by adopting drone photogrammetry and topographic mapping to have a general idea and to document the current condition of the site. As you, as you can see here, uh, the mound is relatively small, measuring approximately 95 meters by 80 meters around 0 0.6 hectares in area with an altitude of 739 meters above sea soil, so above sea level. The mound consists of artificial deposits of limestone boulders and soil, probably reaching up to about four or five meters in depth. A large number of prehistoric flint artifacts are scattered on the surface from which the local name of the site derives. Literally speaking, Halvets van Tepesi means the ruined mound of flint. This is one of the images we have made, also rectified topographic image with 10 centimeters contour. High resolution topographic data here show the, the locations of the previous trenches across the site and slight changes on the surface. Secondly, we did an on-site surface survey for three days before the main fieldworks began. Surface finds were intensively hand collected from five different areas, as shown here. Area A to D corresponds with the main mound, while area E, located in some, in some distance to the southeast, is a uh, circular stone st structure found outside the mound. As a result, over 2,800 pieces of chipped stone and a few stone beads were collected. What we found through the examination of this chipped stone assemblage is that, surprisingly, there are two separate occupation periods at Halvetswan, which is an early PPNB phase, which, you know, which we know from the previous excavations, and much earlier, late Epipaleolithic or early PPNA phase. As expected, no differences observed in the spatial distrib 
distribution of different types of stone tools and fracking technology across different collection areas A to E. That means the site deposit may be accumulated very simply in each time period. The late phase, archaeologically dated to early PPNP, is represented by a large braid industry such as projectile points and bidirectional or bipolar naviform cores. Here you see characteristic piplos points. Obsidian flakes and platelets are also found among the collection. One of the best naviform cores from this period is this one. It measures about 9 centimeters and made on very fine brown flint. The early phase, which you identified in the surface collection, may date back to the late Epipaleolithic or possibly earlier, early PPNA phase, based on the comparison of stone tool industry from the neighboring regions. This assemblage is characterized by single platform prismatic microlith cores, shown, uh, excuse me, shown on the left, and small lunates on bladelet less than three centimeters long. Both are very similar to Chakmaktepe example just presented by Fatima Hoja. The lunates are invariably backed on only one side. Although the layers belonging to the earlier phase have not been exposed yet, but, we are, but I believe future works will reveal them. Thirdly, we started cleaning and reassessing the already excavated structures, and at the same time, we tried to recover the samples, including carbonized grains, lithic artifacts, and other remains. Because our field works were limited to less than two weeks this year, we decided not to make new excavation, uh, excavation areas, but to reopen two of the previous trenches to achieve our goals in shorter terms. The trenches we chose areas K13 and K519 have been, uh, they have been completely refilled with a large quantity of stones, which are also found inside the trenches. So we had to remove all the stones, refilled stones first in order to get the stratigraphic and structural idea, but this required so much effort for us. After removing and re-excavating all the stones and refilled, sto refilled soil, the two rooms appeared in area K13. They are now called North Room and South Room at the present in K13. For the North Room, the excavators interpreted that there were two different phases with a later addition of inner bench-like uh, feature. So this is the north room and this and the south room. So as you can see here in the north room, uh, the bench-like bench features by uh, former excavations is very visible. And according to our stratigraphic examinations, we could confirm two phases of construction, but the room may have been modified very differently. This can be observed clearly on the eastern section of the north room. As you can see, the upper stone wall was constructed undoubtedly upon and after the lower stone wall. This fact suggests that the north room had two construction phases. The yellow lined earlier phase was built elongated in the relatively east-west axis, while the red line, later one, in different axis and size. We do not know if the bench-like structure was functional or not, but we couldn't identify any apparent flaws inside or on the section. When examining the floor of the north room, we sampled one single tiny fragment of carbonized material. Maybe the floor here is not formal one, like famous terrazzo floor of which we find we found no traces but possibly a simple dirt floor. This may have related to the function of this room. The same thing is true also for the south room, where no different definite floor was identified. This room was also filled with numerous limestones, 
maybe intentionally, and less soil deposit. The room was reported as having one niche-like features on the northeast corner, uh, here, but through stratigraphic examination of the section, we found it nothing but an accumulation of filling stones. As we went on digging deeper in the south room, another piece of wall appeared, like crossing inside the room, showing this wall may belong to the earlier pit level, or just dividing wall, or a just dividing wall in the, in the room. Here we uncovered a cluster of artifacts, including a large animal bone, a large uh, projectile point, and a blade fragment. Also found were small charcoal and burnt bone samples, which will become good samples for future radiocarbon dating. Ah, this is the uh, carbon samples ne found next to animal bone fragments and some flint uh, stone tools. And another one found uh, just be just beside the stone wall was uh, burnt bone samples. So the finds of this year are rather small in number, for we couldn't dig so much of original deposits. But all the chip stone assemblage from the structures indicate a large blade industry from bipolar naviform technology. A large people's type projector point and a plunged blade uh, fragment on the right point to the early PPNB lithic tradition, while the repertoire also include some sickle blades on your right, on your left. Other class of artifacts include a basalt handstone, which we encounter at Quebec Itape as well, small bone owl fragments, and various kinds of bees made of various stone types, such as marble, chlorite, limestone, and jadeite. Especially, it is interesting to note that the stone bees were commonly found from the filling deposits. Another area we cleaned is an area K5 19. Here, the previous works revealed a complete subterranean room with a pair of stone pillars in the middle, as you see here, and all four walls with a pair of buttresses. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to examine the building in this season. Lastly, we carried out geophysical surveys using ground penetrating radar, which is GPR, and geometry, geomagnetic prospections at the same time. The site surface is, no, is not so flat due to the presence of a lot of limestone boulders that it was very difficult for the ground scanning with the GPR machine. I will present here only the results of geomagnetic survey because we got much clearer underground images than GPR. Initial examinations of geomagnetic prospections demonstrate that numerous rectangular structures are buried underground across the mound, as you can see here lined in yellow. In addition, interestingly, a large round structure, perhaps encircling the entire mound, possibly wall or ditch, is also detected. The red line here shows the presence of such circular wall-like structure. As we searched for on-ground traces of the structure, we noticed one thing at square A4, as indicated a white arrow. Here we found a stone row of five or six large limestone boulders. This row of boulders may have been part of the circular wall. However, the stones do not continue farther, probably because they were removed or reused elsewhere in the later periods. If the geomagnetic reactions definitely show the presence of the similar stone structure, they must be visible on the ground, because those places are covered with only a few centimeters deposits. Yet strangely, there are no traces on the surface to solve this question. We need to expose the places with strong geomagnetic reactions in coming fieldworks. So finally, it remains archaeologically unexamined if Harvard Swan Tepesi was either a cultic center or a hunter-gatherer's domestic settlement, 
what kind of social cultural significance the site had in the Neolithic period, and to what extent and how this site was related to nearby larger sites such as Kahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe. In order to answer these questions, we need more archaeological data and more advanced analysis. But I hope that our new project within the Tastepeler project will shed new light on more understanding of the Neolithic in the region. Last but not least, I want to express my deep deepest thanks to all the uh, all supports you gave uh, gave us, uh, provided by these people. And thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Shakira Dilim. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.